Thank you. Over to you. That working okay? Looks good. So thank you for the introduction. And first off, I mean, a big shout out to all the Miami folks for organizing these presentations and these workshops. I've attended most of them and they've all been fantastic so far. So I really hope that I'm not the one to buck that trend. I also do wanna issue a fair warning that I have two children below the age of four running around in the house with me. So if you happen to hear something that sounds like the wheels on the bus, you'll know where that's coming from. <laughs> so today what I'm gonna be talking about is a paper that I've been working on called Private Information Acquisition by a Freedom of Information Act Requests. And this is something I've been co-authoring with Stephen Glazer at UNC, Bryce Schoenberger at Colorado, and Charlie Wasley, who's with me at the University of Rochester. I do also wanna add before I start that we are very thankful to have this opportunity to get feedback on this paper. So if you have any comments, suggestions, uh, even after the presentation, absolutely don't hesitate to email us, contact us and let us know. Okay, so getting started, what we do in this paper is we ask the research question of what are the determinants of private information acquisition and what are the outcomes that it helps to predict? And so at first glance, this probably seems like a pretty fundamental or straightforward type of question, but there's actually surprisingly very little empirical evidence on it. In contrast to this, there's a well-established literature um, on the theory side of things. So going back to like Grossman and Stiglitz, Kim and Varechia, McNichols and Truman, I mean, there's just a long literature talking about private information acquisition analytically. On top of this, there's a growing literature that looks empirically at public information acquisition. So think Google, Edgar's types of search. So given that there's all this literature out there, we think that maybe the main reason why we haven't seen as much empirically for the private information side of things is that it's just really difficult to observe private information acquisition. And so that's where we think we can come in and help to contribute to this literature. So specifically, we're going to look at private information acquisition using something known as the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA for short. It's probably worth uh, giving some background details about the Freedom of Information Act, but actually we're not even gonna start by talking about the FOIA and instead the story starts with confidential treatment orders. So CTOs, the way they basically work is if a firm has to submit a SEC filing, a mandatory SEC filing, and they believe that that filing includes proprietary information, then they can request a CTO. The SEC, if they grant the CTO to, to that firm, then allows the firm to redact or remove information from that filing when they submit it. So if you're anything like me and you hear the word redaction, probably what you have in mind is something like top secret military document where names and places are stricken out by Sharpie. In the case of these SEC filings, it's honestly not all that different. Uh, you have details removed from the filings and replaced with an asterisk instead. So if the CTO is granted, then the SEC is going to take the redacted version of the document, post it onto Edgar, and then they're gonna retain the unredacted version for themselves. Besides going through CTOs to help, um, or besides getting exempted through CTOs from disclosure, firms also don't need to disclose ongoing SEC investigations. We think this is probably because the SEC can close an investigation without taking any sort of action. So for our purposes in this paper, we're going to look at hidden information from both sources. So from both investigations, as well as from CTOs. So just to give uh, a little bit of a better picture of how the CTO process works, I have an example here from Active Power Inc and their CTO. So if you read a, or you take a look at it, you can see that what they're redacting is information from an exhibit 10.1 that comes from their April 20, 2008 10Q. And this redaction lasts through January 1st, 2011. 
So this exhibit that's in question is actually a purchase agreement between Active Power Inc. and Caterpillar Inc. And if you read through the agreement, you pretty quickly get to their point five, and you can see that <clears throat> there's already some redacted information as shown by that asterisk that I mentioned. What this information really looks like in the original document is that it provides details on the payment terms for this purchase agreement. One thing to note though, the SEC doesn't actively replace the redacted version of the document on Edgar with the unredacted version. And this is even occurs after a CTO has expired. So given that that's the case, you might wonder, okay, how did we get our hands on uh, the original unredacted document? This is finally where the Freedom of Information Act comes into play. So the Freedom of Information Act allows individuals or organizations to request previously redacted information. And in this case, the CTO expired in 2011. I put in a FOIA request in 2017 for that redacted information. And in response, the SEC sent me this letter stating what, what they found, as well as the unredacted forms uh, that were filed by Active Power Inc. Now, although this process is done through the Freedom of Information Act, the process itself isn't really free. There are going to be some explicit costs that are charged to the requester, usually covering labor costs. And on top of that, there are implicit costs that we think are more important. So these implicit costs come in the form of delays for the SEC to respond and fulfill any requests for information. In the extreme, there's a group of requests that are large enough that the SEC considers them to be voluminous and they put on something known as the FIFO track. So forms that are some or requests that are submitted to this FIFO track actually can take up to multiple years, like three plus years before they get uh, fulfilled. So it's specifically these costs that we think clearly delineate FOIA search from forms of public information search like Google and Edgar. And actually to this point, uh, Blankis Poor Dahan and Marinovich in their recent paper, they actually discuss process, three types of processing costs that characterize private information acquisition. So the three being awareness costs, acquisition costs, and integration costs. In our case, we think that FOIA very clearly exhibits all three types of those costs. So for that reason, we think it fits pretty well into that definition of private information acquisition. Another way to think about it is to consider a continuum of information search where you have public information search on one side, private information search on the other side. We think with this definition, FOIA search at least takes a, a step towards the private side of that continuum. All right. So before getting into the thick of things, I think it's probably worth taking a quick peek at our results. So our primary tests are guided by two theoretical motives for withholding information. And these draw, are drawn from Bensberger and Monahan's 2011 paper. So in this paper, they talk about two motivations, one being agency cost motivations, where managers would want to withhold information that they think would reflect poorly on them and on their ability if they got out. And then also proprietary cost motivations where a manager would withhold information because they're fearful that a competitor could use it against them. So given these incentives to withhold information, we actually think that they will also help to drive why somebody might search for information as well. And we actually find evidence consistent with this idea. So specifically, FOIA search seems to be more likely to occur for firms that exhibit greater information asymmetry in particular information asymmetry that comes from or relies on information that's not easily uncovered through our usual means. We also find that FOIA search is a distinct construct from Edgar search, so our measure of public information search in this case, but how that being said, they still do seem to have some sort of complementary relationship as well. Once we get a sense for the determinants, we then ask the question of what is the FOIA information actually used for? 
and we find that it helps to predict real firm outcomes. Moreover, the predictive ability of the FOIA search is tied with the motives, the original motives for conducting the search in the first place. So again, going back to those agency cost motivations or proprietary cost motivations. So to run these tests, we get our data from a lot of the usual suspects. So we have CRISP and CompuStat, but a significant chunk of our data is going to come from something known as the FOIA log. And the FOIA log is essentially a series of files that the SEC maintains to keep track of all their FOIA requests that they receive. In it, it includes information about the request submit dates, uh, the information that's being requested, and importantly for us, that we'll get to later on, the requester's identity and identifying organization. This data we have from 2005 through 2017 the reason why we start in 2005 is simply because the SEC only starts keeping track of the electronically of these FOIA requests in, in that time. Um, but technically speaking, you could have issued or applied for a FOIA request even before, well before 2005. All right, descriptively, um, just taking a quick look, we find that FOIA search increases over time with a peak in 2015. And we also find that there's a lot of industry variation between, um, between firms. Specifically, we see that there's more FOIA search for healthcare firms and less FOIA search for financial firms. So this at least provides some initial evidence or at least um, consistent evidence with the idea that when there's more private information available or um, on the other hand, when there's less public information available, you're more likely to conduct FOIA search. Breaking down the distribution of FOIA search across time, we actually find something pretty interesting here as well. So if you take a look at this last column, what we do here is we take the, uh, we analyze the distribution of FOIA search within a given year and the, look at the proportion that occurs within a three week period around an earnings announcement. And so at the bottom, you can see that the overall average for these FOIA searches is about 16, 17%. To put this into perspective, if FOIA search was randomly distributed across calendar time, we would expect a rate of 12, which comes from four quarterly earnings announcements times three week periods. So 12 divided by 52 total weeks in a year. And that would give you 23%. So the fact that we find 17%, a smaller number, suggests that FOIA search is less likely to occur around these public earnings releases. Why is this important? Well, in contrast, Google search and Edgar search, prior literature has find, found to be specifically clustered around these public uh, information releases. And so again, this is starting to foreshadow some of those clear distinctions between private information search that we find and the public information search that has been studied in the prior literature. In terms of the outcomes that we examine, we're going to rely a bit on those Benz, Berger, and Monahan motives for withholding information. So specifically, we're going to look at two outcomes tied to each motivation. For the agency cost outcomes, we examine securities class actions lawsuits and CEO turnover. Then for the proprietary cost uh, outcomes, we're going to look at product market fluidity, or basically competition, and patent related lawsuits. Also for our initial tests, we are going to run it on the sample of all FOIA requests, but later on we will also want to sharpen our inferences a little bit better, and so we do this by trying to categorize FOIA searches into types and types based off of those two motives for, um, for information search. To do this, we are gonna take advantage of that requester identity information I alluded to earlier. And specifically, we're gonna look at the requester identities and the organizations, search for them online and read up on their background information and their business descriptions. And based off this, what we find is that a good number of them actually specifically state that they submit these FOIA requests to try to uncover 
uh, SEC, ongoing SEC investigations. So we thought it was pretty interesting, especially because the way they go about it is they're actually submitting FOIA requests trying to probe for denials of their requests, and specifically denials per exemption B7A. What is exemption B7A? It's actually this exemption that is um, allowed for the SEC to deny requests for information that's compiled for law enforcement purposes. So then if you're taking it from the requester's perspective, you can think about it as, I just received a denial citing B7A. I can then infer that the target of my FOIA request is likely under investigation. So given their nature, we consider and we call these types of FOIA search to be probes. And we associate probes more likely with agency cost outcomes and agency cost motivations. In contrast, on the other hand, the remaining types of FOIA search we consider non-probes, and we expect those to be better tied with the proprietary cost motives. Now, it's important to note that we don't view these two motivations to be mutually exclusive. And actually, to that point, the Benz et al. paper even specifically state that it's more likely both motivations play a role in incentivizing managers to withhold information. And they do so jointly. So from our perspective, we really view it as just one type, the probes being more likely to exhibit one type of motivation and then non-pros being more likely to exhibit the other. Okay, so with this data then, we are gonna conduct two main sets of tests. The first set is gonna look at the determinants of FOIA search. And we have the general prediction that FOIA search will be more concentrated among firms where there are greater benefits to be had. In other words, where there's more likely to be information withheld. To do this, we're going to estimate negative binomial models of FOIA search counts on several variables, such as information asymmetry, proprietary costs, and firm performance. And what we find is here in table three, let's start um, looking at the first column. We have the base model of the determinants of FOIA search. And, that, and we find that quite a few of our variables show up as to be significant predictors of FOIA search. So that first variable is our, our name for insider trading. We see that's a significant positive predictor of FOIA search. Then if you look a little bit further down, we also see trade secrecy or trade secret mentions also seems to be a significant and positive uh, predictor of FOIA search. Skipping column two for a second and going to column three, we run a similar regression, except this time we have Edgar search as our dependent variable. And this helps us provide a comparison between the determinants of Edgar versus that of FOIA. And here we find there are some pretty clear differences. So just to highlight a couple of these, you can see R&D and book to market ratio both have opposite signs for the two types of search. So this seemingly suggests that when there is information withheld, particularly information that might not be easy to um, acquire, at least using these public forms of public information search, then you're more likely to see FOIA search. All right, so coming back to column two now, here what we do is we add Edgar search as an explanatory variable to the determinants model of FOIA. And we find a positive coefficient on Edgar search, which suggests that complementary relationship between FOIA and Edgar. All right, so in terms of our outcomes tests, we're gonna run uh, a couple of different models to estimate how and try to link how FOIA relates to these outcomes. Two of them uh, that we specifically focus on are using in a FOIA search indicator variable and then also a FOIA search counts variable. I also do wanna add that we do entropy balance our uh, indicator variable samples and because as McMullen and Schoenberger show in their recent paper, this is an effective way to ensure covariate balance, particularly when there's uh, nonlinear relationships between the variables. And what we find is that at least for the agency cost outcomes, there does appear to be some relationships between FOIA search and then class action lawsuits. 
There's also some evidence that it's tied to CEO turnover as well, but I mean, we'll readily admit that this is not the most consistent set of results across specifications. On the other hand, when we look at the proprietary cost outcomes, we see that the results show up gangbusters. So we have FOIA search, both the indicator and the count variable predict uh, patent lawsuits, and then also the count variable itself predicts changes in product market competition. So at least on a basic level, we feel that this provides some evidence that of the benefits of conducting FOIA search. So this is what you get in return. You are able to better predict some real firm outcome. That being said, we still think it's a, a little bit odd that the results are so sporadic when it comes to the agency cost outcomes. And so, I mean, as we were scratching our heads about this, we thought that, oh, maybe one reason for this is that we're pooling all of our FOIA searches together in those tests. So really we're just seeing and observing on average results. In some ways, given that there are, there's multiple reasons why somebody might conduct FOIA search, we might be throwing out the baby with the bath water in that case. So rather than throwing and getting rid of this variation, instead we're gonna to try to take advantage of it by splitting the sample into the probes and the non-probes requests. Right away when we do this and look at the determinants models for the, for the two, we start to see some differences. So insider trading is a positive predictor of probes, but does not seem to predict non-probes. On the other hand, we have R&D and new financing seem to positively predict non-probes, but negatively predict probes. So there does seem to be this difference. And moreover, the difference seems to be coming from the motivations for the search as we, as we would expect. So insider trading with the agency costs and then things like R&D more with the proprietary cost side of things. This distinction becomes even clearer when we're looking at the outcomes models. So we see that Patent suits are predicted by probe search, and there is some evidence that CO turnover is predicted by probe search as well. However, for non-probes, the concentration is within patent lawsuits as well as product market fluidity. So again, in line with that idea that non-probes are better tied or more closely tied with the proprietary cost motivation. Now, one thing I do wanna step back and add is that when we look at the probes outcomes, we interestingly don't see a significant relationship with the class action lawsuits. The reason why this is a bit strange is because these are the requesters who specifically state that their goal is to uncover ongoing investigations. So you would expect them naturally to be tied to class action lawsuits. So we try to dig a little bit deeper into this and we use data that we get from a FOIA request that we submitted about those B7A exemptions. So within the subset of FOIA requests that have B7A exemptions, we find that those requests are significantly tied to the class action lawsuits. So this does seem to be in line with what the probes requesters are submitting their requests for. All right, so to wrap up, Not mean to do that. Uh, so to wrap up, we find that there is significant demand for private information acquisition. And this is shown by the willingness of firms to bear the costs to, to gather that information. On top of that, we see that this demand is, seems to be driven by information asymmetry, particularly that, that, that stems from both propri proprietary costs and agency cost motivations, a la Bensberger and Monahan. In addition, we see that FOIA search is associated with real firm outcomes, but that this predictive ability of FOIA search is going to heavily depend on the motives for the initial search. So again, agency costs versus proprietary costs. All right, so that's all I have. I guess we can open up to questions now. Thanks a lot. So actually, I had one to uh, start it off. Yeah. So just a clarification. So when the CTO expires, so one, can I request a FOIA request for information before the CTO expires or that won't be granted? You, yeah, so exactly. You can, you can okay. request it, 
but then okay. you'll get a response that says it's uh, yeah. so two so once it um expires i know you said that the sec doesn't update the filings mm -hmm. right but will the firm itself replace uh the unredacted or the redacted filing with the unredacted filing on their websites or in any sort of other sort of ir platforms what i'm trying to get at is the is the FOIA request the only way to get this information even though the cto is expired so technically you know yeah. the, the information could be out there that's a good question um i haven't checked i haven't seen any instances where the firms, firms did uh put, put up and make the replacement themselves um so yeah, that'll be interesting to look at. I don't think they do, uh, or, but yeah, I'm not sure. And that'll be something I have to check. But yeah, for the most part, it seems like the main method of getting this information would be through the request. Boy, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, next question we have, uh, John, Sue. Hi, John. Yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> Aloha, Jason. I hey. really enjoyed your talk. So you are continuing the very nice trend of the Miami webinar. You know? <laughs> I also <laughs> want to give the Miami accounting faculty a big shout out. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the series. I have a few questions. First, yeah. why is the FOIA request peaked in 2015? Does this mean uh, in the late period, people find that the FOIA requests are not useful as useful as before. Um, so that's a good question. So in around the 2014-2015 era, so this is uh, actually heavily based off of conversations that we had with um, one of the employees at the Office of FOIA Services with the SEC. What she told us was that around that time, there was a big push for make for a greater transparency by the Obama administration. And so that might be why there seems to be a peak. But that being said, I mean, 2015 is pretty late in our sample period too. So it's, it still seems like the numbers even at post 2015 appear to be quite high. Um, so I think if we drew it out through 2017 or through current time as recently as we can, we would still find that there's, you know, numbers that are um, in the tens of thousands of requests. So also, since you have the identity of the FOIA requester information, could you provide some descriptive, descriptive statistics about the identity of these people? I think it would be quite informative. And my, my the other question that I have is, uh, when you do the determinant, could you control for the Google search? Because I, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you see, uh, people can get information through Google search, Edgar search, and or FOIA requests. Yeah, so um, so taking your first question in terms of the characteristics that surround the requesters, I think we, we do try to provide some information on it, just, I mean, just anecdotally, what types of requesters these are. So they appear to be mostly You'll have like firms like hedge funds, IP consultants, and then you also have these probes types of requesters as well. Um, but it is a little, admittedly, a little bit difficult to get, you know, information that's linked to, say, something like CompuStat, um, because a lot of times these organizations aren't, aren't going to be included in the coverage if they're not public. So in terms of, um, remind me again, the second question was, Oh, my second question is, uh, maybe you, uh, you need to consider the Google search in your determinant oh, right, model. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, you see Google search, Edgar search, for your requests, these are all different ways of getting information. So maybe they are easy substitutes or complement, uh, uh, complementary to each other. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a good point and something that we can definitely consider. I mean, if, if we have the data readily available, I, I think that's something we could easily try uh, but to a certain extent i think we feel that google search and edgar search are kind of act in the same way so we'd expect similar relationships to appear between FOIA search and google search that already appeared between FOIA search and edgar search but yeah given the data that's certainly something we can look into thank you yeah, thank you 
Let's give over to Roman for a second and go to uh, Anthony. Joffrey. Hi, Jason. Um, yeah, so yeah. looking through the FOIA logs, the SEC differentiates the request between like consultations, exhibits, you know, FOIA and triage. Um, mm -hmm. Can you expand maybe on these classifications and the types of information provided for each? And have you examined that uh, those information, uh, the information provided by each type yeah. of classification? Yeah, yeah. Good question. So this is something like when we first started this project, we definitely had this exact same question. Like if you were to take a look at the FOIA logs, what you'll see is that there are a few different types of classification for FOIA search. And um, yeah, we were kind of puzzled as to what these different classifications refer to as well. So it turns out, I mean, our main focus is going to be those classified as exhibits and those classified as FOIA under the FOIA name. So these make up the majority, I would say, of the searches that are received. There are some additional types that um, we consider as well. So triage is one that, well, as we were told, it basically represents those FOIA requests that are repeated requests of the same type. And so there's maybe some externalities with uh, addressing them over time in the same way. And then besides that, there are also, I mean, things like consultations. These refer to links between maybe govern, another government agency is making a request. And so they might want to I mean, do so for a consultation, particularly if they're conducting an investigation of their kind. So I think for us, we really wanna focus on these requests for exhibits and FOIA because that's the information. I mean, we're thinking in terms of SEC filings um, and we don't want to include requests for, I mean, they can, they can have private requests specifically for like, people's names and things of that nature. Um, so we're, we focus on a subset of those, but the biggest subset, I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. Roman, did you want to follow up? Yes, uh, Jason, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very interesting paper. So I have a question about uh, the, you know, the content. Uh, what is typically, do you know what is typically redacted? right, mm -hmm. uh, from these filings. Do you have any statistics or maybe the SEC has something on that? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. And that's something that um, we've, we've thought about and we tried actually in the very beginning to get information on. So based anecdotally speaking, there mm -hmm. most of the time these things to be, um, like the CTOs seem to be coming from information for material contracts and agreements. So it's like price and quantity type of information that's removed from those, um, those contracts. However, we don't, we, so this is more associated with the CTOs because that's what actually removes the information. So while we could try to get a large set of, you know, all the previously expired CTOs, um, it, it does become a little bit difficult because the SEC limits the number of FOIA requests you can put in at a time and the number of FOIA um, firms that you can target with those FOIA requests. On top of that, you have to figure out who, who has the CTOs first. And so that's, um, that can be pretty difficult. We, we did try to do it. I mean, we tried to look, there's a log of all the CTO order requests um, that's also available, but uh, it was a bit, I mean, it was just difficult to clean and try yeah. to map into a FOIA request that we could, you know, just, a sweeping one that we could get all the information from. Right, you know, I was going to suggest, and it's also maybe technically difficult to implement, right? But like in your example, you showed, well, here's information in the contract and they have an asterisk or something. Mm -hmm. It's just maybe you can search uh, filings, you know, for these asterisks or that information and you get, can like get a better sense, right? You know, is it a risk factor, some contracts, tax information? Well, that, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, we had not, well, at least I hadn't considered that. Um, so basically like do a text search for Yeah, yeah, this asterisk. is personnel, sort of, you know. Continent. Yeah, and yeah, that's something we can definitely look into. I think that'd be interesting. And that might be a good way around the, having to go through the CTO thing. Um, right. Thank you. All right, uh, next up we have uh, Daniela. Hi, Jason. Good to see you. Um, hey. I have a couple of questions that are pretty much related. One is more specific and the other one is a little bit more 
general related to uh, um, your research question. So um, uh, I guess you're not the only one that is uh, submitting this FOIA request as an academic. So I'm wondering if in your, uh, and maybe I missed it during the presentation, I'm wondering if you can clean the FOIA account by removing the FOIA requests that are coming from researchers like us. Mm. That would be the more specific question and related to, uh, well, I'll let you respond to this one, then I'll, I'll get to the other one. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, mean, I think we would like to do that, but it's honestly, given the data, like the format of the data is pretty difficult to do because a lot of times, I mean, it's not like it says necessarily it's an academic or sometimes it is an academic and it doesn't necessarily say um, classify them in that group if it classifies them at all. So we'd be having to match names. We can, I mean, we certainly could try to remove as much as we could, but um, for the most part, I mean, like in our case, we, we haven't done that. And, and I mean, so from our perspective, we think that it probably, I mean, it does add noise into that, the non-probes group of um, requesters, but I still think that the non as I mean, to the extent that the non probes still captures proprietary costs requests more so than the probes, then I think we should be okay. But yeah, that's definitely something we would like to do. And I, I will also add that it, the percentage of requests that come from these academics is very small. So I, I don't, I'm, yeah, I don't expect it to have too significant an effect to the point that it would drive the results. And so the second question is uh, related, but given your first response, maybe you, uh, you're already telling me that you cannot do much, but I assume that from the spoiler request, you can see whether the requester is at least an individual or a corporation. So mm -hmm. my question is, I'm wondering if it's important to answer your research question, who actually the identity of the, of the requester. Uh, if it's a compare, I mean, you're, you're pushing a, a, an agency uh, or a um, proprietary cost story. So uh, I wonder maybe if it's a competitor, would, would it be a specific individual, like a, an employee of that firm that will request, or you can observe requests made by a corporation and therefore at least you can you know, separate requests coming from an individual and requests coming from a corporation or a law firm. Maybe, maybe sometimes corporations ask law, their consultants or law firms to, to put down the request. So I'm just wondering if you did anything on the requester side. Because yeah, it's so, important to your question. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. Um, so what we find is that most of the time, all, even if there's an individual wants to make a request, most of the time it goes through another firm or a third party that specializes in making these requests for certain purposes. So we have, I mean, the, for instance, the probes organizations, they, they have their specific statement that they're gonna make requests for the SEC investigations. But even besides them, you see things like uh, the IP consultants or hedge funds where, yeah, it's the organization themselves make, um, making the request and for the purposes of trying to uh, uncover that hidden information. So most of the time it does seem to come through organizations or at least individuals tied with organizations. Uh, but yes, I mean, I'm trying to think, maybe that could be still something we can try to, at least to just better clean the sample a bit is to look for um, indicators where the organization specifically has like an ink in the name or a corp in the name or something like that and keep those, but versus the individuals who don't have anything like that and we can try to remove that um, but yeah I, I, I will like the majority yeah. definitely do come from organizations so there is this paper on uh, related to this there is this RFS paper Gargano et al 2020 yeah. that you look at uh, oil request by a new, uh, hedge funds if I recall correctly so maybe that's one thing that you can look at I mean if you cannot mm -hmm. leave this entangled individuals from corporations and within corporations uh, mutual funds or, I mean, I don't know how much middle funds are interested into these things, but hedge funds are apparently. So maybe mm -hmm. that can, tell, can help you a little bit disentangling an agency story from a proprietary cost story. I mean, I'm not sure yeah. to, to what extent an hedge fund is interested into acquiring proprietary information. Maybe, yeah, for sure, if they want to trade on that. Uh, so, but probably the agency stories are a little bit more compelling in that case. Anyway, just a suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.
Okay, next up we have uh, Rosie. Hi, um, thank you, Jason, for the very nice presentation. Uh, so I have a question on the outcome of FOIA search test. So I'm wondering, have you ever considered looking at the outcome at the uh, investors or mutual funds, hedge funds level? Uh, for example, do we see that hedge funds or mutual funds who engage in the private information acquisition can consistently generate alpha? Um, the reason that I ask this is because now you look at the firm level and there could be possible endogeneity concerns, right? So uh, certain firm characteristics can drive the FOIA search and the FOIA search can have um, outcomes on the firm. So it sounds like a loop here. Okay, so, so I mean, I'm going to start with that last point. So in terms of there being an endogeneity issue, we're not we don't try to make a causal statement that says FOIA search causes these outcomes to happen. Our idea is that it can at least provide advance notice that these things are going to happen later on. And then we, to a certain extent, this information helps contextualize um, information that these investors might already have beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of looking at the hedge funds and the investors themselves, I think that's a great point and something that would be nice to be able to do the one issue that we have there is simply that sometimes these FOIA requests, it's not clear when the information is received by the, uh, the investor that, were, that um, made the request. So in a lot of cases, actually, only parts of the information are sent back. And this shows up in the FOIA logs as like a partial denial or a partial fulfillment and rather than a full fulfillment. And so there we can't really tell um, if they have all, you know, enough information to do something with, or if they only have a little bit of information that, and they're still waiting on more to come. And so with that, it's, it's hard to single out a specific date where we want to see whether or not these um, firms perform better, at least on a price basis. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Yep. Next we have uh, Diane. Hey Jason, I have kind of a setting related question um, sure. and correct me if any of my statements are wrong because I don't have as great an understanding of the setting as you obviously do. So my understanding is that the redacted SEC form and the request are filed at the same time. And then after that, the request can take about a month or two to review. And then there are some, like there's a little bit of back and forth and deliberation between the firm and um, the SEC if it's needed. So technically a firm could redact the form knowing that the request would not be approved and this loophole could be used to redact information even if it won't be allowed, but it'll be a pretty material amount of time before that information could get released. So I was wondering, do you know if there are any of these cases and if they exist, if the request is not approved, does that form become unredacted at that point? So you're talking in terms of the CTOs? In yes. terms of redacting? Oh, in terms of CT. Okay. So that process, we, I mean, at least any, oops, oops. Um, from what we've seen. And so Stephen, actually, one of the co-authors has done a good amount of work looking into this mm. as well. He, what he's seen and what he's found is that almost all CTOs are approved. So there's almost no cases where they, I, like, I literally think that percentage is like 99 or 98% approval rate. Okay. Uh, so there's almost no case where that it gets denied. Um, in terms of the timing, I'm not, yeah, I, I do think it, um, I think the month does seem right, but yeah, I'm not sure if they could use that to like, um, to their advantage in terms of a, a gaming type of situation. Out of Even it. if it was, it happened so very little, like you said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's it, thank you. Next is a Ramon. Yes, uh, well, I have a question, you know, basically the way, even right now, right, so even right, uh, you know, conclusions, right, the way you motivate uh, your question, your analysis, well, let's look at these, you know, there are some firms uh, and these firms have this information asymmetry and that's why, you know, you'll have um, investors or market participants, you know, trying to, you know, get this right information. And then in your uh, table three, I think it's like probably the main table you have. I'm a little bit surprised, you know, and this is again, this technical question, right? So I apologize for that, but I'm a little bit surprised what happens with your um, 
market volatility, right? Coefficient. So to me, it seems like when you have this high uncertainty, which you can measure, you know, through returns, um, you have some division of returns, you should mm -hmm. probably expect to see a negative coefficient, right? So, uh, so uh, I'm sorry, a positive, right? So the, the, the more uncertainty you have, uh, the more you have this, um, you know, private information searches. And it seems to be very inconsistent. Um, and also like similar when you look at the a thing that I'm asked is analyst, right? I would also think when you have less analysts with got information, you should also see more of that, right? Or these private information searches and, you know, and it goes to the different direction that at least I would expect. Do you have, you know, any sort of idea why that's so? Yeah, let me just, uh, so the analyst case, I mean, I'll just focus on that one for now since mm -hmm. that's what we left off with. But I mean, our thinking is that once you add in, so if you're looking in column two, once you add in like the Edgar search, you see that it's picking up a lot of the, like the analyst effect disappears. And so, so we think that's because- attention, right? If I'm correct, let's look Edgar, how much, you know, how many, how often they download, right? So this is almost like attention that takes away from some of this attention. Right. Right. Yeah. And so like we find that to be like in our view, it's more tied with the public information search as opposed to our private information search. Um, yeah. So in that sense where the private information search is going to be more concentrated in things like yeah, R and D when there's, it's not necessarily an attention story. It's more of there's, there's just hit it more likely to be hidden information. Right, but you would join, you know, you would, you would try trying to motivate this by saying permission is symmetry, right? So I would like to see, you know, some relations, uh, you know, with some practice programmation of symmetry. And at least to me, a number of analysts and, you know, the volatility stuff, volatility seems to be, you know, these. Oh, methods. okay. I, I, yeah. And, and I, they go a little bit different than what I would expect. And, you know, and the volatility is just, you know, as you see, <laughs> column two, column one, not significant, column two, negative, significant, column three, positive, mm -hmm. very significant. So that's a little bit positive. Right? That's kind of what I was getting at. Gotcha, gotcha. I see. Yeah. So okay, we can. I think we can probably be a little bit more careful with. I mean, how we're defining information asymmetry specifically in this case. So I mean, the the main idea is, I, there is a information asymmetry, but information asymmetry can pick up both types of like it, the information can come from both um, sources where there's readily available information, and then also sources where there's not so much readily available information. And so that distinction is going to play a role because we expect the one where the information is available, that that's going to be focused on the Edgar type of search. You'll see more Edgar search. You'll see more public information search to try to resolve that information in asymmetry. However, for the kind where it's more focused on information that's not easily obtainable, like you know there's, you know there's something out there that you don't know, but you don't know what it is that you don't know, that type of thing. That, right. that's being picked up what we think by R&D and like growth so, options, things so, like so, that. So. We expect that to be more concentrated for the public or for the private. Yeah, so, so maybe what you want to do, maybe you want to do some sort of, again, look at interactions, right? <clears throat> Have R&D tracked with analyst following or, you know, or volatility, right? You know, something like this. Maybe that, that's, I think, what you're trying to get at. Mm. Basically that, you know, there are different things, but once, if you look at, to look at these specific subcategories, well, here's a firm has a lot of R&D there's also a firm that, you know, we don't know much about, right? So that's maybe where you would see people. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, that's something we can definitely consider. consider doing. Yeah. Thank you. All right, actually now it's me. So this is a kind of a broad question, so I can open this up to all the, the co-authors also, <laughs> uh, if they're in the webinar. But I was just wondering why you decided to go down the real outcomes uh, path and sort of, attached to that, what do you sort of see as a primary objective or contribution? Because this, the setting's super interesting, so I didn't know much about it. So I really enjoyed sort of learning about it. And you have great data, which means you have, I would say, degrees of freedom about where you could take the paper. So I was just wondering sort of what prompted the going down the real outcomes path. Yeah, so in this case, I mean, well, I guess I should ask, I mean, do you have, where else would you want to take it? Maybe we can write another paper on it. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I wondered, like, was um, was one of the sort of the primary objectives of the paper to to show that we could use a FOIA request as a measure of private information? Because that seems to be what 
is mm -hmm. private information search at least because again i don't think we have too many proxies on that and you kind of state that it's always hard to sort of measure this so this would be yeah. one way to to get at that and then i would think if you're going to go down that road route like market-based outcomes or tests so i don't have you have some you're going to have some indoctrinated issues here of course but if you looked at at the firm level you got a lot of requests going on at a given firm do we see that you know prices around the eas respond quicker things like that so you can actually kind of get at yeah private information being sort of you know, put into the price and, and stuff like that i just the real outcomes was not something that would have struck out to me immediately it, it's still interesting i just wondered sort of what, what prompted the motivation for the yeah for so the the, the the main motivation for us was just coming from i mean we wanted a big picture type of outcome that and see whether it's related but it also comes from the fact that there's a i mean that major delay between when you get the information and so when um when you submit a request and then when you get the information so that and that distinguishes from the public information search so in those like in places where maybe price discovery is occurring extremely quickly, we don't, we're not really expecting somebody to make a FOIA search and expect and hope to get information that they can then immediately use, right? And so then we were thinking, given that this information, it does seem to be requested still, like we're observing it, what are the benefits? Well, like what could it offer somebody? And so from that standpoint, we thought, okay, maybe one way is it helps predict these long-term outcomes and, these yeah these long-term outcomes so another so, i mean another way to think about it is like it's, what are the benefits that people are getting in order to be willing to take and bear the costs um to bear the cost to commit uh to conduct the search so if that's the case do you i mean does that map squarely with some of the theoretical front end you sort of have in the paper where some of the papers are actually about the private information search where here you kind of mentioned it's not so much that the information's being gathered per se at a time. It's the, the FOIA setting and the request given it comes later is a little bit, um, you know, disjointed. It's maybe yeah, from yeah, some that's of the a, initial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, and so this this has been something that we've been um, thinking a lot about. Is just okay if it's not going to be used necessarily for those really quick price price um, pricing cases then i mean how closely does it then tie into the existing theory which a lot of it does focus on those that short-term information-based trade and so our view is that this scene i mean a given that there's not much information about just private information acquisition in general we we already view like okay we're providing some evidence at least in a step in that direction. So even though it may not be a perfect proxy for private information acquisition, at least it's a significant, like a significant and worthwhile move in that direction. Um, from another perspective, we also think that, I mean, in this case, a lot of the intuition that guides that theory or that comes from that theory can also guide this type of information search. After all, we, I mean, we observe it happening in equilibrium there must be some reason behind it there must be something to be gained and as a result we're going to base that and draw from the intuition from those those papers yeah yeah i mean one argument you could make if you're putting the request this might not be the only thing you're doing in terms of the private information search yeah but this is something observable right yes. so we probably yeah. know that the people that are putting in these searches are also engaging in other yeah this is so, like part of a mosaic that they're they're painting right. Yeah, Great. Good point. Excellent. Oh, since the time is approaching, we have a couple of questions. So I'll get to uh, Anish. Hello, Jason. Uh, great Thank paper. Thank you. So uh, I just wanted to say I'm a behavioral experimental researcher. So this is uh, not the kind of work <laughs> I do. But I was just wondering whether uh, you could, you know, have a behavioral story here. Essentially, this is information that is uh, you know, hidden from investors, right? Investors don't get to see this information. So mm -hmm. how do you think investors react to that? Do they think that, okay, this is, you know, strategic information, the company is, you know, doing something good and it's going to make a lot of profit in the future, or it's information that, you know, the company wants to hide uh, and it's kind of bad news. So is there some way that you could actually speak to that, you know, uh, using this data? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there actually uh, is a recent working paper, I think by Hui et al, that I think they're basically trying to look at exactly that, where is it more of a story where managers are hiding this bad news information? I mean, I, I don't know that I necessarily call it a behavioral thing because it still falls within, like that's like the agency cost explanation. Yes, yes, yes. Um, for conducting the search. But what they, I think what they find, if I remember correctly, is that it does seem like managers are hiding um, bad news information more so than make, like strategic proprietary information okay. when they're getting these requests. So yeah, that might be something to consider um, taking, like trying to take a look at. I, I definitely think that would be interesting, maybe beyond the scope of our paper right now, but, yes, beyond, um, yeah. but yeah, but definitely a, an interesting direction that we, I mean, we can think about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. Great. Next up, we have uh, Zayu. Uh, hi. Hi, Jason. Thank you for your presentation. So my question is just out of curiosity. Do you think your paper and some previous paper on this setting help to reduce the cost of information acquisition? Because now more people know it. Uh, since the request fee is not that high, so it's usually between like hundreds and thousands. So do you think those hedge funds or related parties just request those information anyway and to make those private private information like a public information over time? That's an interesting thought. Okay. So, I mean, it's almost like uh, if I was to draw an analogy to like the anomaly literatures where mm -hmm. once somebody presents a paper on anomaly, then everybody starts training and it goes away. Um, I hadn't thought about it like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suppose that is possible. I, I think, I mean, a lot of these, the requesting firms, their clients are already these hedge funds and investors anyway. So it does seem like at least a group of them do know about it. Uh, I, but even then, I, I'd be surprised if it, it gets to the point where like all this information is just is treated as public just simply because it still takes time. I mean, yeah. to, before you get um, anything fulfilled and you also have to know when there is information missing. So it's kind of like that awareness cost from the blanket for it all paper. So yeah. um, things like that make it still a bit more costly than, um, than the usual public information search. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. a good point. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right. Well. Almost right on time, so I don't think if anyone else has a question, let us know. Otherwise, I think uh, at this point, we'll. Oh, David, sorry. Uh, David? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, what information do firms hide in confidential SEC filings? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this question is kind of similar um, to one that we had earlier in terms of trying to look at what what the actual information is. Um, yeah, from Roman actually. So I we had anticipated that it's pretty difficult to get a broad sample of the, all the information that's contained in those CTOs because you have to have. I mean, not only the CTO data, you also have to match it with. Free, um, or conduct Freedom of Information Act requests for each of them. And there's a limit to the number of FOIA requests you can um, put in at one time. But, uh, but at least we can, maybe we can kind of get a sense to it like Ramon suggested by using some textual analysis to maybe just focus on the asterisks that show up in, in SEC filings and see if that uh, at least provides us some details in terms of, okay, what types of firms are attracting this information and uh, maybe in what situations or what documents they're doing it in. So th yeah, that's something we can think about doing. But up until this point, we haven't done much of it because it, it did seem like, I mean, it was, it's very difficult if you take a look at the CTO data uh, to get at. Next. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I think next week we have uh, Phil Stocken, but I'll as normal, send a little uh, email around to everyone. Uh, if you have any other questions, please do feel free, as Jason said, just to email the authors uh, yes, directly. Please. I'm sure they'd love to hear the feedback. And everyone have a great weekend, and we look forward to seeing most of you again next Friday. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, guys.